We will mic him up sometime. It'll be dangerous. Hold on, guys. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, and it's chapters um, John 14, verses 15 through 20. Hear now these words of God. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I like what Amy said about words. Now you take any commonplace word, like pulpit, and you say it 20 times in a row, pulpit, 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 pulpit. After a while, it's no longer a word, it's just a noise. It's an absurdity, it's devoid of meaning. Now that ought to make us aware that some of our greatest words of the Christian faith, like sin, faith, redemption, spirit, that we're gonna be talking about today, we've been using those words and saying them for 2,000 years, and after all those years of handling and mishandling them, often they become threadbare. You hear me use one of those words and you say, oh, I've heard it so many times and your mind just switches off. But I keep using them, we keep using them, we keep plugging it way at them. Why? Because what we learn is when we live into them and they live into us, they're very real, they're undead. The word spirit, it's not just that maybe it has been overused, but we have often used it in a way that just remains an abstraction, floating about three feet off the ground. But I think Scripture helps us because it attaches to these old and sometimes abstract words, other words that um, are metaphorical and enlivened, like spirit slash breath. Oh, we say, okay, breath, yeah. Our foremothers and forefathers, how did they determine someone was dead when the chest was no longer moving? A feather was put before the nostril, and if it was unstirred, well, a person was dead when there was no breath. A person was alive that had the power to get up and rise up and move and shout when they had breath. Oh, okay, so spirit is the very mystery and power of life itself, yeah. I want to use another word today with spirit. It's the word energy. It's a good word because when you walk and take several steps into the higher sciences today, you're going to hear the language sprinkled with that word energy. Now we know more about heat and light. What are heat and light? They're just um, waves of energy and motion. We once thought the atom was a fixed finality, but now Adam's just another word for energy, something going somewhere. Albert Einstein said, all matter, all physical stuff, the pews you're sitting on, they're made up of energy, something going somewhere. There are some theorists today, they're called energy field theorists. They have this concept that um, invisible, non-material structures are the basic substance of the universe. Now you know something about that. Gravitational electromagnetic fields, if you hold a fluorescent bulb, bulb under high voltage wire, there's a good chance it's gonna light up. Why? Well, because you're standing in an energy field. Okay. Now think about another kind of field that just holds the entire cosmos together. Yeah. Now that's energy at a macro level. Let's bring it down to a micro relational level. Luke has come to our staff and he's um, given us all kinds of books to read. We're reading this book together called The Energy Bus. It's a good book. And, and the author says that so much of our relational life is energy. 
Now, I want you to think about the projects at your work that energize you or that burn you out. Think about the people that energize you and drain you. How about people that you have worked with and you find that you're finishing each other's sentences or you start, you get to the point you're saying the same thing at the same time? That's all about energy. Do you, do you know this phenomenon called telephone telepathy? Do you believe it? I've experienced it. You find yourself pondering, wondering about an old friend, someone you have, you've been thinking about, haven't seen, haven't heard from, and it's not long, the phone rings. It's them. It's all about energy. Sometimes the force and energy of a person is so strong, you can feel it when they enter a room. A person that comes into the room with intense gladness and gladness fills the entire room, although the person says nothing, does nothing. Yeah. How about esprit de corps, corporate, team spirit, energy? About a week ago, I went up and met with the Wilderness Trail staff, 18 of them. They had just been through intense wilderness training and also kind of leaning into what we're going to be, their, their focus, their mission for the summer. I got out of the car, been there just five minutes, sitting around these two picnic tables with them, and I could feel it. They had been galvanized um, by a power that had drawn them together. You know. Esprit de corps, you could feel it. Synergy, one plus one, equaling more than two. Okay, now wait a minute. You came here this morning to address and to be addressed by God. So where does God fit into all this? Well, look. Just as all matter has energy and all relationships have energy, and just as you have something like spirit in you to stir up life in others, so God has energy. God has spirit. Listen to what Barbara Brown Taylor says about it. She said, the spirit of God is up there, it's down here, it's all over the place, it's inside our skin and out. God is the web, the energy, the space, the light. She said, for me, it's not enough to just think of God as some beginning source, but think of God as responsible for all this unity, the very energy, the very intelligence, the very eloquence, the very passion that continues to make it all go. And what's she talking about? Listen to me. She, she's talking about the nowness, the present tense of the energy of God, or Holy Spirit. You hear that? Energy, Holy Spirit. Jesus believed in that energy. John 14, he walks into a room that is deflated, de-energized. Why? Because their life together, they felt like it was being siphoned away from them. You know what was happening to these folks in that moment in John 14? They were dealing with the impending death of their friend and Rabbi Jesus. And Jesus walked into that darkness and listen to what he says. He says, you know, don't you? You know, don't you, I'm not going to be leaving you orphaned. No. I'm going to be giving you another that has been here all along. I'm going to be giving you another. Spirit comes from the Father. Now, the translators have had a hard time trying to get real particular on the Greek word that's here, called, Greek word paraclete. Some say it means comforter. Some say it means advocate. Maybe when it comes to your life and mine, maybe the best translation is helper. This is healing, helpful, transforming, sustaining energy. We have an energetic friend, Holy Spirit. Okay, now what happened to that room? Jesus offers the gift. What happens to that group of de-energized, deflated followers? Little by little, some of them who would never believe they could tie their own sandals without Jesus, well, they, they, they found capacities they didn't even know they had. L little by little, they started opening their mouths to speak, and they began to discover they sounded something like Jesus. Little by little, um, they started doing things beyond what they had ever experienced or expected. What do you want to call that? 
breath, energy, Holy Spirit. You, you know it's still flowing you know, among us. Uh, last year, a friend lives in another place, and he shared with me something of his journey. He said, Rob, um, I'd been living by old maps. You know what it means when somebody tells you you're living by an old map? For him, it meant he kept going back to the same old dead ends, to the same old parking lots. He, he felt like his life was just day after day, moving bricks from one pile to another. It had no purpose. There was no real sense of journey. He was just on a circular journey. He said, after long bouts of seeking, searching, praying, doubting, believing, doubting, believing again, he said, one night, it, he said, the only way I can describe it, he said, it was like I got a second wind. There was something stirring. I found a power to get up and roll up the old maps, surrender to the former ways. And he says, now I'm not on the circular journey. I'm, it's a new one. Now, what do you want to call that? A nice story of hum human renewal, of course. Yeah. Or do we call it an act of the Holy Spirit? I I've seen the potency of this energizing one, work in a room like this, this many people, dozens of people, hundreds of people at a time. I remember in a former church, we, former church, we got to a, a crossroad moments. We were making some difficult decisions, and you would expect it. There were differences of opinion, and we got to this rather large meeting, and you, you could feel it. The air was bent with discord and difference. And when we got there, people weren't talking with each other. They were talking at each other. And just about all the energy was being spent and... Um, you know, people defending their positions. We were about 20 minutes in and a woman raised her hand and said, excuse me, excuse me. We began this meeting and no one offered a prayer. Might I offer a prayer? Well, what do you say? I said, of course, I was helping to lead. But I have to tell you, I was afraid. I thought, uh-oh, she's going to use this prayer to make her point. <laughs> she, she's going to use this as a weapon to beat up somebody over the head with. But, but no, that's not where she went. It was heartfelt, it was centering, it was unifying. All I can tell you, because I felt it, I saw it, the air changed in that room. After that prayer, people began to talk with each other and we got creative. We, we started coming up with possibilities that I don't think we would have reached if left to our own devices. I don't know what you want to call that, a group spirit, corporate harmony. I'm going to call it an act of the Holy Spirit. You see, that, that energy, Jesus said, it's been there all along. You should have known that, but you, you know I'm going to be leaving that with you. Now think about it. If, if the flow of that is with you, with me, with us, moment by moment, then maybe our noblest response is to keep plunging into the flow. Look, the wind can be blowing, but if you don't, haven't raised your sail, you're not going to go very far. Look, you can be surrounded by oxygen, but if you don't breathe, um, it's not going to do you much good. Remember the metaphor Jesus used is the power of the energy of the vine that flows into the branch. Look, the hydraulic inner systems of that vine can be pulling all kind of water and nutrients from the ground. The sap can be flowing. But if that branch is not attached, open, accessible, it's going to wither. As, as a young boy, I used to read the sports writing of Red Smith, great sports writer from New York. Toward the end of his career, somebody said, Mr. Smith, please tell us what's the, what, what, what do you understand as the core of what it means to be a writer. He said, really kind of simple. He says, being a writer means sitting down in a typewriter and opening a vein. Oh, I like that. From the vein of the writer to the reader, for better or for worse, a transfusion. And that's what Jesus is talking about. The branch opening a vein, a transfusion. So our part in the transaction, you see, is in the morning, 
before your feet hit the floor, you, you ask, you pray, you seek, that you will plunge moment by moment, step by step into the Spirit. Now, if that sounds a little esoteric, a little abstract, I want you to remember the context with which Jesus offered the helper. He begins by saying, you know me, you, you know me, you've seen me. And you know, if, if you love me, then you're going to love the world as I have loved you. See, that's, that's not now so abstract. It's that same relationship, that same compassion, that same grace, that same mercy, that same gratitude flowing into us, taking up residence in us. The branch biting from the start of the day in the vine. And then when you move place by place in the day, you may be getting ready to have a meeting with someone. You have a few free moments and you say, here I am, God. May your love bless me in such a way that it can flow through me and to the person that is coming before me. Or you run into a problem, you run into a challenge, and you just simply stop long enough to say, give me strength, Holy Spirit. Give me patience. Give me wisdom. Or in the middle of the day, you sense that somehow um, you're out of step with the Spirit. Okay. That something else is guiding you. Maybe fear, maybe anger, maybe prejudice, maybe envy, maybe inferiority, rivalry. You acknowledge the misstep. It's like breathing, exhaling. You let it go, inhaling. You ask for the power to get up, brush yourself off, and start walking in the Spirit again. The flow is there, the clarifying, unifying, empowering, inspiring, provoking, challenging energy of the Spirit. Our task is open a heart, open a mind, open a vein. Love the story about the woman She's in the grocery store and she sees this man. He's got his two-year-old child in the grocery cart and the child is not real happy about being there and he's having to navigate this. And so she's watching this father and the little boy. And she's listening to him and he says, now little Billy, um, just calm down. Little Billy is gonna be okay. Little Billy, just hold on, hold out. It's gonna be all right, little Billy. Well, she watches this for a few moments and then she comes up and she says, sir, I, I, I don't mean to get in your way. I, I just has to tell you how moved I've been by the wonderful, patient, loving way you talk to little Billy. He says, ma'am, you, you don't get it. You see, I'm little Billy. <laughs> well, sometimes I'm little Billy <laughs> and, and, and you're little Billy. In those moments when we need something beyond ourselves, the Holy Spirit will not bully us, never will, never knock down the door to the human heart. But it's there. The whisperings, the promptings that speak of thoughts, the love, joy, peace of God, they're there. Ask for it. Open a heart open a vein. Well, I've told this story here before, but it's too good on this day not to tell it again. It's really one of my favorite stories. Lawrence of Arabia, you know, was a historic figure. An Englishman goes and spends a lot of his years in the Arab world. He's something of a military hero, a statesman, um, just kind of a Renaissance man in many ways. So there's the Paris Peace Conference. And he's made friends with a number of these. Um, at that time, many of the Arab states had not been really formed, and there were just these loose kind of city-states and um, built around these different Arab chieftains. And so he takes a number of these Arab chieftains with him to Paris, and they are amazed. They're mesmerized by Paris, by the Eiffel Tower, the architecture, the museums, the food. But the thing that just completely overwhelmed them was something in the bathrooms at their hotel. It was the wonder of a faucet. They could walk over to this faucet 
And just with one little turn of the hand, wonderful, living, fresh water just running into their rooms, into their hands, into their glasses. Why was it? Oh, look, you, now remember, these were nomadic Arab leaders. They had spent so much of their life looking for and fighting for on Oasis. And once they got it, having to hold on to it. And it was precious. It was um, so little of it. And here they were in a room. And there's just this unending supply of water. So they get ready to leave, and Lawrence Varabi, he's down in the hotel lobby waiting for his friends. He can't find them. He keeps looking at his watch. Where are they? Nobody knows where they are. He goes back up to the hotel rooms, and there they are, all of them, in one of the bathrooms. And what do you think they're doing? Well, one of them had gotten a pipe wrench from maintenance. And there they were. They were working on that faucet. They were going to take it with them. <laughs> Magic faucet, water forever. Lawrence said, no, 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 you don't understand. These faucets are connected to all kind of piping. It goes for miles to connect this little faucet here with these great underground reservoirs of water. You, you detach this faucet, it's useless. And they said, no. We take Magic Fawcett home. Now, I wonder, could we be even more credulous in our Christian lives? They thought that endless water would run through unattached faucets. Have we moved about at times thinking that the well springs of God's energy could flow through closed taps. See, that's our part. Open a heart, open a mind, open a vein, open a tap, let it flow. Let us pray. Oh God, we have moved about this world and lived at times as though you were finished with creation, so far from the truth. The Spirit is still moving across the waters of chaos and nothingness and bringing forth life. The energy of your Spirit is still breathing life into our piles of dust. It's forever flowing, your breath, your energy open our hearts and minds so that we might receive all you have to give, not just for our sake, but for the world's sake. In Jesus' name, amen.